Well, colleagues, our next speakers are ready. Um, we're just a minute ahead of time, um, but uh, as I think everyone's staying anyway, we will just crack on. Um, so we now have uh, Daniel Johnston and Rachel Wall from King's College London, who will be talking about podcasts, the new MOOCs. So over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, to just get us started, we're going to just do a quick activity. So if you're able, could you raise your hand? Cool. So do you want to put your hand down if you have an Alexa or a Google Home? Okay, lower your hand if you've taken an audio tour at a museum. Excellent. Do you lower your hand if you pay for Spotify or Apple Music? Um, lower your hand if you've done a Duolingo or Rosetta Stone activity. Oh, is that everyone? Oh, no, a couple more. Lower your hand if you've ever listened to Serial, the podcast. Lower your hand if you have headphones with you today. Oh, last one. Lower your hand if you've ever been to a live performance. Ah, there we go. <laughs> So what this exercise really shows is how immersive and versatile that audio actually is. It's used in a variety of different places, in loads of different contexts, and for various purposes. As a medium, audio is really flexible. It's cheap and it's easy to consume. And perhaps one of the cheapest and most flexible forms of audio for consumers is podcasts. So what are podcasts? At the most basic form, it's an audio clip that you can access through the internet, you can download or stream. We can be more specific in that and we can say it should be delivered through an RSS feed so you can subscribe to it. But for our purposes, we also think that there's a social and cultural definition that we need to come to terms with. That we have certain expectations about what a podcast is today, that it's a media form as well as a technology. And that's really informed by the way that people are creating and consuming podcasts. Cool. So what do we know about podcasts today? Well, lots of people are listening to them and lots of people are making them. But where did this come from? How did they take off? Well, Richard Berry writes in 2015 about what he calls this golden age of podcasting, which was launched by the popularity of the podcast serial. So how it all started, podcasts were really this rival to radio. Producers and listeners had this opportunity to really explore really niche topics and really take advantage of on-demand listening. And these advances in technology could really control what people were listening to and when they listened. So when we think about Serial, it arrived at what Barry describes as this golden age of podcasting in 2014. And the podcast arrived when it really mirrored what he describes as the classic narratives and the experiences of audiobooks. And it really prompted listener engagement People really had a mental and emotional connection with the topics that they were listening to. The content was really topical, really culturally relevant, and it really sparked loads of conversations. People had loads of questions, they had debates, they had agreements, they had disagreements. And this engagement and this word of mouth really created this overall shared experience. And really the popularity of Serial kick-started what Barry describes as this golden age of podcasting, as we know podcasts, and how they've risen today. So in a golden age of podcasts, it's not surprising that we've started to look at the application of the technology to learning and how that can be done. And typically, scholars have looked at bespoke podcasts created for very specific learning aims, learning environments, and specific courses. But what about the podcasts like Serial, podcasts that are created for the general public, for entertainment, but have arguably really serious um, content that can help us to learn. Well, this is really what drew us to our main research question, which is that can listening to these mainstream podcasts be described or interpreted as a learning experience? So to explore this, we decided to look closely at the podcasts themselves. We found a list of the 50 most popular podcasts on a particular day and selected four podcasts from this. And we selected them by choosing ones that seemed like they had educational content within them and also by choosing a range and genre. Uh, we then completed an autoethnography where we kept listening journals while we listened to the podcasts. 
uh, and performed close textual analysis on a few episodes to look at the detail. Cool. So the first podcast that we listened to, which we've already talked about, was Serial. So for those who aren't aware, Serial is an investigative journalism podcast that narrates a non-fiction story over multiple episodes. So when I started my listening journey of listening to Serial, I'd already listened to season one, so I jumped right into season two. And just as a really brief description, season two investigates the story behind deployed private first class Bo Bergdahl, who walked off his post in Afghanistan in 2009, was captured and held captive by the Taliban for five years. Wow. So my listening experience of listening to Serial threw up a lot of really interesting points. And the first one that really struck me was the narrative structure of this series. The episodes fit within this overall structure. You need to listen to each of the episodes in order to really gain the full experience and the complete story. And this really maps onto what Walker describes in learning design in that how narrative really helps us to structure knowledge. It's a really good aid in remembering and imparting knowledge. The other thing that was really significant for me listening to Serial was how the story is told and how information is presented. You producers spoke to a lot of different people. They really took care to get a really balanced account of events as they unfolded. So how does that map onto the listener experience? Well, I decided to go online and have a look at what people were saying about the season. And unsurprisingly, people had a lot to say online. There were huge conversations, huge debates and discussions about the content. And this really maps onto what King describes as this cooperative or jigsaw learning, learning model, where views were taken outside of the listening experience and really debated and discussed outside of the context of learning. And knowledge was really acquired and shared collectively. The second podcast we looked at was TED Talks Daily, which is basically recordings of TED Talks that were given to live audiences um, by experts on particular topics. So this felt like a curated collection of lectures um, and mapped really directly onto sort of the typical sage on the stage model we see throughout traditional education. Um, in contrast to Serial, the listening experience did not involve starting at episode one and wor working through to the end. Instead, I went through and I selected episodes that seemed interesting or relevant to me. And this way I was able to co-construct my listening and learning experience. The structure of the episodes themselves also resembled a lot of uh, learning experiences that we see. In, um, there was scaffolding, so the speaker would establish foundational learning and grow complexity out of that. There was segmenting, selection of data and information, and um, in digestible chunks. In fact, while I was listening, I would often pull out statistical facts that are, were being shared in the, in the episodes and text them to my husband. Um, but I think what I found most striking about the TED Talks Daily episodes was that these speakers, these educators, were clearly not neutral. Um, scholars like Paolo Freire would have had a field day with this, with these speakers who while they were sharing empirical research and factual information, were intertwining it with their philosophical beliefs. Cool. So the third podcast that we looked at was The Guilty Feminist. So The Guilty Feminist is a comedy podcast hosted by Deborah Francis White, and it really explores 21st century topics relevant to women and mostly from the perspective of women. So in a similar way to TED Talks, the engagement in online learning that Walker describes is really evident in how I chose to listen to the episodes that I did for the purpose of our research. I really chose topics that I was either familiar with or topics that I wanted to know a bit more about, or I chose comedians that I knew that I liked. So where and why I listened was also really important in my research. I mostly listened to episodes while I was on the bus during my commute, as a lot of people do. Often I found that I was really deeply engrossed in what I was listening to. We would get three or four stops ahead and I would not have remembered how we got there because I was really involved in what I was listening to. I even laughed out loud at points and I'm sure people thought that I was going a bit crazy, but that's the level of engagement. 
I also listened to some of the episodes at the gym, which I'd never considered doing before, but surprisingly they made my workout go a bit faster, which I was not expecting. <laughs> but really the significance of this is the environment in which you um, listen to some of these episodes can really map onto what we already know about learning design, and that it drew a lot of connections with cognitive load theory. This idea that being deeply engrossed in what you're listening to really has your brain and your imagination really heightened in those moments. And in those senses, I was really focused on just listening to what I was paying attention to. And finally, listening to these episodes was a really reflective experience. As a woman myself, I really enjoyed reflecting on like the lively debates and discussions that were being talked about and really thought, drew up like thoughts and feelings that I was comparing to the experiences of the guests being spoken to. And the informal but consistent format of all of these episodes really does create this reflective space. Finally, we looked at Brexit Cast, um, which is a news show uh, following the events around Brexit. It's hosted by political journalists based in Brussels and Westminster and features guests from around the world. And yet, in the episodes, the hosts and the guests are able to create a really connected discussion despite their geographical distance, um, something that we look for a lot in distance education and online learning. The hosts also modeled skills for political analysis. So they modeled things like where to get information, how to debate, how to interrogate facts, um, in ways that really map onto what we know about observational learning. And finally, um, the Brexit website provided other ways for you to get involved um, and to learn by taking quizzes or reading blog posts by hosts. So the experience could be really multimodal. Cool. So when we go back to our original question, which explored really whether podcasts can be described as a learning experience, and for us, we thought the overall conclusion was yes. They are learning experiences, and they're in a learning experience that really maps on to MOOCs in the most similar way, in that they're learning objects, they're educational experiences, that just really reminded us of that MOOC experience. So how were they similar? Well, they mapped on to what has already been established descriptions of learning in the literature that we reviewed. They have low entry requirements, they're inexpensive to consume, Listeners need no prior qualification, knowledge, or expertise to listen to them. And they're really similar to MOOCs in that they are massive. We looked at serial productions, um, download um, numbers of season one and season two, and their episodes have been downloaded more than 250 million times, showing just how far and wide that reaches. At the same time, mainstream podcasts have a lot of the drawbacks that MOOCs have, so they're difficult to assess, they're difficult to evaluate. Um, but they also have some of the issues around demographics that we've seen criticized in MOOCs. So we had this huge expectation that MOOC was, MOOCs were going to widen participation in education and allow access to people who weren't familiar with traditional routes of education. But in critiques of MOOC, we've, MOOCs, we've seen that MOOC audiences tend to be degree educated and Western middle class, and that is the same for podcast listeners. So in the US alone, um, podcast listeners were 40% more likely to have a university degree compared to the general population. Ultimately, you can say that the most distinctive difference between MOOCs and mainstream podcasts is that podcasts are designed to be learning in the same way that MOOCs and courses are. And yet they're arguably a more flexible and mobile and less bandwidth intensive way to engage people with educational content. So, what does this mean for us? So podcasts definitely have this opportunity to widen participation, to democratize knowledge, and to democratize learning. Here at King's, we um, have a couple of different teams and departments who already engage in podcasts for the purpose of disseminating information and for discussing their research. This is a page from our War Studies department who have really grown their podcast following discussing their current research and up-to-date developments on areas that they're speaking in and they lecture in on a regular basis. Um, it should also impact the way we think about MOOCs. So what if we start thinking about MOOCs 
as more similar to podcasts as a media form rather than formal courses. It's really important for people like us who work in online learning. Cool, so why is this important to us? So we both work in an online learning team where we work with audio on a daily basis. And this really started from a desire from us to understand how we currently use audio in our daily um, working practices. So we started with an interrogation into our instructional design process. How do we work with audio at the moment? Well, we interviewed our instructional designers to find out what their thoughts were and came out with some really interesting insights. Our instructional designers talked about the really inventive ways that we have for the potential use of audio in online learning, ways that are really rich in evidence. And their descriptions really mapped onto Middleton's premise of audio as being a really rich learning space. And in general, their personal consumption of non-learning non focused audio really highlighted how much of an entertainment media it is in guiding and inspiring learning design. So overall, we thought we really need to start thinking more broadly about what is digitally enabled learning. So ultimately, this research is more of a beginning than a conclusion. Um, it raised an enormous number of questions for us, and it has a, a huge number of limitations. So we need to keep asking more questions about the design of audio media for learning, um, but also about how to extend education to massive cohorts of learners, about the ever blurring lines between formal and informal learning experiences, um, and the identity of universities as learning providers in a world of increasingly free and open content. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much, um, perfectly timed, and we have um, uh, just under five minutes for questions. Um, so I'll ask if we can get the V-Box window up. Um, quite a few things have come in. Um, can the talks in the tower be put into bigger rooms? You don't have to answer that. That's clearly a question <laughs> that's come from elsewhere. Um, but I wonder if we could just, um, uh, I'll let you pick maybe the first one of those you want to engage with. Do you want to do the learning Excellent. disabilities one? Danielle, do you want to do the second one? Yes, absolutely. So I think this is a fairly important question. So it's about um, to what extent podcasts and other audio can be relevant in the context of participants with, uh, learning dis with hearing disabilities. Um, so I think podcasts have advantages um, with accessibility, so they can be a great advantage to um, for instance, people with dyslexia who might struggle with reading, um, but they also have drawbacks in that if you're not able to hear, you're not able to consume them. So I would recommend for anyone um, who's considering creating audio or podcasts to provide an alternative. Um, so in our practice, when we, when we create audio for online learning, that's something we, we've invested in, is that we get a human transcription of all our audio. Great, thank you. Um, and you, you talked a lot about um, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, MOOCs as well, and there's a question mm -hmm. there. MOOCs are built around connectivism and peer-to-peer -peer interaction. How can podcasts be interactive, or I guess, how, how could they be used interactively? Interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, at the moment, we kind of use audio that goes alongside visuals, and certainly something that we would like to do a bit more would be to think about how um, we talk a lot about like scaffolding and learning, and I think it would be great to make them interactive, but I think we need to kind of go back a few stages and really think about how we can use them to supplement the content that we're already putting out there. I think it definitely is gonna be something we should explore in the future, but at the moment, um, if anybody is doing that, then I'd love to hear more from you because I would be really interested in learning more about that as well. Thank and I you. think, yeah, the other way that we did see, for instance, with Serial is that people were connecting in these informal online communities. So there is connection happening. Um, and actually, again, if we go back to the critique of MOOCs, some of the criticisms that we have is that there actually isn't connection happening um, in MOOCs, especially in the ones that focus more on sort of, um, independent and asynchronous learning. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're conscious that these questions will be coming from colleagues in the room. But is there anyone who isn't using um, uh, the VVOX app who has a question they would like to ask? Yes, gentlemen, third row from the front. And if you could say who you are as well, please. 
Hi, um, my name is Tom Buckley. I come from UWE. I'm a digital learning manager there. Um, I just, I just wanted to ask, from your kind of looking at either the research or your own experiences, how did you find uh, your reception of these podcasts? Um, I, I kind of got the feeling with uh, I listen to about 20 hours a week. I'm, a, I'm an addict, um, but I see amongst other people that the intimacy of them and the directness of them sometimes stops the criticality of the content that's being delivered and it's something that you picked upon at the TED Talks. Is that something that you, you see? Like, do you think that sometimes people receive it as the truth rather than something to be discussed? I think that's a really good point. Um, and yes, we definitely did see that thing with TED Talks, but when I went and looked at reviews of TED Talks, that was also a criticism that listeners were sharing. So they were concerned about that as listeners. Um, I think that we see it sort of an equal level of um, yeah, non-neutrality, if you like, in the classroom all the time, in written content. Um, I actually think that there's an extent to which the spoken word um, leaves a lot more opportunity for critique than r the written word. I think there's, um, there's an extent to which when we see something written down, we take it as being more factual than when we see someone or hear someone speaking it and we realize that it's, it's a point of view. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're just about on time, so I'm going to have to give apologies to colleagues who posted some of the other questions, but presumably if you're around, you'd be happy to have a chat yeah. with colleagues. Perfect. Okay, Definitely. so we can thank uh, Danielle and Rachel, and we'll move on to our final talk. Edina's work with learning technologists helps to develop skilled, data literate students who can change our world for the better. Teachers and students can develop and share coding skills with multiple our Jupyter Notebook servers. Our Digimap services deliver high quality mapping data for all stages of education. Future developments include a text and data mining service, working with satellite data and machine learning, and smart campus technology.